take it away. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Put a thumbs up if you can. Um, I'm just going to share my screen, if that's okay. Uh, let's have a look. Is it screen two? Uh, can you see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, so um, thank you for um, inviting me along. It's a great privilege to be part of um, everything you're doing. I've been, I've been out to meet some of you in person in Boston. I had a fantastic time and was incredibly well looked after. And uh, like I said, it's a great privilege to be part of everything today. Um, I wanted to start by reading to you something I'd written as soon as I was asked about this, uh, uh, you know, this forum today. And the first slide you can see there is a picture of a, a snowman that was made by some of our young people out the front of the school. So it looks like a very old fashioned Hogwarts type place, but that's actually the school um, where our children live. And uh, it felt to me like we've been trained and prepared for the pandemic our whole lives at Novalis Trust. Um, we've gone on a journey of understanding trauma and its effect on organizations. And we were grateful to be helped along the way by people. Um, we've had numerous lockdowns in the UK, as you have in, in America. Um, we've had losses, people have lost people. And suddenly we're, we were experiencing trauma um, which was unusual because it was all at the same time globally. And I don't think there's ever been a time in history when we were all experiencing the same thing all at the same time, perhaps other than the, the Second World War. And, um, you know, we feel that through the established uh, positive relationships that we have, um, we were able to be creative and supportive. And people were resilient and energetic to a level that seemed un unimaginable at first. But then as we started to kind of explore the journey we've been on in the last 10 years through our own approach, uh, being trauma informed and thinking about attachment and relationships, really pushing relationships at the heart of, um, of what we do, it then became less of, um, less of a surprise that people were doing quite well. And so uh, the regulators in the UK uh, that check us out and say whether we're any good at um, Ofsted, they've judged us as outstanding, they've also judged us inadequate. They've called us life-changing and a cause for concern, and yet um, our environment and approach and most of our staff remain the same. So we have um, 278 staff at Novalis Trust in total, and 123 of those staff have been uh, with us over five years. And uh, I've got some more data a, a little bit later. So um, I'm sure the stories I'm gonna share are not unique, but they're just kind of our experience of, of what we've gone through. And um, I kind of wanted to in introduce people to, to a concept I, I, I started to think about. And it's the concept of the, um, the remembering self and the experiencing self. And they are very different. So in a way, it's not what's happened. It's a story we tell of what's happened. And storytelling is particularly important for children, as we all know, and particularly important for some staff. So really a question for us is, are we coping with COVID or did we cope with COVID? So those things are very different. So um, Novalis Trust itself, we were a little bit of background. We were founded in 1954, Cotswold China School. So we've been going for a long time and we have our own model of approach, which is called the Novalis model. And I've added resilience to our model, having done some work with Laurie, who's gonna be speaking later. And Laurie really shared with us the importance of resilience and being strong and traumatic things happen in life. We know that, but there's also inbuilt resilience and creativity from people that can overcome those, those um, adverse experiences. So um, a nice cute picture for you now, which is a uh, couple of our dogs. So um, as I'm talking, can you, hit uh, are you able to see the screen okay? Um, yeah, okay. So uh, this is Rosa and Stan, they're two of our support dogs and they're playing in the snow around the back of the school. And uh, they're, they're just put in there for a cute effect really. Um, Paradise House is, this is a, a couple of photographs of where our adults live and they're 18 to 65 um, years of age. And the, the picture on the left is our cafe that we created and the building on the right is, is our care home. And you can see that the environments are beautiful environments that we try to make as therapeutic as possible. 
that's the idea that the environment can be therapy. And we also have William Morris College, which is a college and a school. And this is a picture of William Morris for you to see. I just want you to get a sense of the importance of, of where people live. And I know this can't be the same for everybody, but it's just important that we have that kind of sense of the environment. All of our provision was founded on the ideas and principles of Dr. Rudolf Steiner. And he was a philosopher who started the Wardle Schools movement. And Steiner believed very much that the environment can do a lot of the healing for people and the sense of relationship and the sense of community was very important to get people through um, adverse experiences. And one of the things I like about Steiner's ideas is he talked about practice humility knowing that you can always learn from children. And I think that's, that's uh, a nice uh, mantra. So a couple of slides on Steiner's basic ideas on education and care. And he felt that the goal of education should be the freedom of the in individual. So it's not about repetition and hitting people with facts and figures. It's about um, seeing that every child has a gift and thinking about how, I can, how, how can I be creative around that? How can I establish a relationship? One of the things I really liked, and we talk to our teachers about this quite often, is um, if you want to educate, you really have to educate yourself. You can't just expect people to, to children in particular, to just rock up and listen. You need to be prepared to um, be committed to your own education and your own delivery. And then if you are committed and you're creative, then you will find creative and committed students in your classroom. So, you, you know, as leaders, you've got to be as uh, committed to the ideas that you're, you're bringing to education um, as much as um, the people that you're teaching. And so, you know, moving things forward, a um, couple of definitions that are in the handouts around what it means to be trauma-informed. Um, it's not new to any of you, I'm sure. Um, resilience, I've taken a quote from Laurie, and I, I hope she doesn't mind. Um, shout out and respect to Laurie there. Um, that resilience um, is very important and resilience was something that we were overlooking, if I'm honest. We understood, we understood trauma, we understood attachment theory and how children need to feel attached to key adults, but we were really missing that resilience element to, to the work. Um, and so we focus a lot on, a, on a, our own attachment styles and um, because we're a 52-week care provision and the children are with us literally every day of the year, um, including Christmas Day, the teachers and care staff and, my, and, and the leadership team become attachment figures for children who don't have that parental carer. So we really have to understand attachment uh, theory and understand the importance of relationship. And so through the secure attachments that we try to foster, we are acting as caregivers for, for children. And it's important to know your own attachment style, to know if you're securely attached or if you feel anxious about things or, or whatever, or you, or you take um, any sense of failure as a huge rejection, because you're gonna project that onto the children um, you work with. So um, from a relationship-based perspective, um, this is me and a guy called Lyndon. We started doing some video vlogs together. He was a very challenging young person. This is a few years ago now. He was in lots of physical interventions regularly. Um, he would throw chairs across the classrooms at his teachers if they offended him. He had an overriding interest in IT. And so we decided to focus his interest in IT and we would work together to see if we could do anything productive. And Lyndon and I started vlogging and we did weekly um, vlogs and we interviewed people and we celebrated birthdays and things like that. And um, he managed to uh, fulfill his placement with us and moved on to college and he did very well. So we were able to take something that was causing him a lot of distress, his overriding um, impulses around IT and turn it into something creative. So um, before COVID, we, we, all of us were completely swamped with information. So globally, I was reading some data, there's 144 billion emails circulated in the world every day. 4.3 billion different people sending emails. 61% of those emails are non-essential or even irrelevant. So we are completely bombarded every day with information anyway. And then the pandemic hits and we haven't got anything to tell anybody. So 
the pandemic hits uh, our organization and there's no guidance. Um, we've got no idea. It's never happened before in our lifetime. Kids are asking us what's happening. Staff are asking us what's happening. The government don't know what they're doing. And one of the problems is that we found that if we've got nothing to tell people, whether there's no training, there's no guidance, there's nothing, then everybody needs, everybody makes it up. And it's very challenging anyway, but if people make up information during a pandemic, it's even worse. And this was our situation in the UK. Um, no guidance, some guidance, too much guidance, conflicting guidance, no PPE, masks that don't make a difference. Um, the, our government were telling us that masks don't make a difference. Um, no point wearing them. And then we were fined if we didn't wear a mask. Um, and so basically there was a sense of uh, confusion and repetition. So this was our timeline that we shared. Um, sorry, this details our timeline through the pandemic. And we tried to encourage children to um, go home if they needed to. Uh, we wanted them to spend time with their families if we felt that was helpful. And it was very challenging because when the first wave of COVID hit us, we were inundated with families that didn't want their children home. And that was really hard for us to take because we kind of thought that everybody would want their children close to them. But actually we had the opposite. And some, some foster families and some adoptive families were actually going for additional funding so that the children would stay with us, um, so that they wouldn't leave. And that created a kind of moral concern for us. What are we gonna do? Um, so we had to quickly get information put up together to see um, what we were gonna to start to tell people. So we started social stories for children uh, in the school. What is coronavirus? What's COVID-19? Um, what, what are the symptoms, you know? Um, the importance of washing your hands, the importance of um, taking care of people and also the types of activities that we, not, we were not gonna be able to do anymore because the children couldn't go out because of lockdown and things. So we were trying to be clear with, that, with some young people. So again, social stories about things closing. Information with teachers um, and care workers and clinical staff was challenging. And I'm very interested in um, how we support staff and I'm involved in a lot of staff training. And we engage with our staff quite frequently in supervisions and all sorts of stuff. And we found that nearly every conversation we were having with people was a difficult conversation. So difficult conversations can be categorized as a what happened conversation or a feelings conversation or an identity conversation, okay? So a typical what happened conversation could be that there's an unsettled situation in the house, there's a de-escalation applied, it didn't work, there was a physical intervention, things happened, there was a restraint. So then the conversation could be around what happened, okay, tell me what happened. It's a completely reasonable question, tell me what happened, okay? But we could ask people what happened and they would immediately um, were feeling that we didn't care about them. That we were into feelings conversations or identity conversations really quickly because they're trying to deal with a, uh, a pandemic. They're worried about their own families. They're worried about everything. Why on earth are we asking them these questions about what happened as if they've done something wrong all the time? So we realized that these difficult conversations were um, looking at blame, um, triggering people, people feeling guilty. Um, so we moved away from that. We then started to think to ourselves, okay, well, um, how do we care for people who care? So if, if we're the carers, how are we caring for the people who care? And there's a question we started to ask ourselves. So in the UK, there was a survey recently that said 37% of employees in the UK are suffering worse mental health compared to pre-COVID levels. 28% believing that their employer, that's us, people like us, are not doing enough to safeguard them. Well, if I'm asking people to go and work in a house where children have got COVID, it's a completely reasonable thing to, for them to say, don't you care about me? You're asking me to go and work in a house where I'm, I'm almost certainly gonna get COVID. Does that mean you don't care? So we had to really take care of those feelings because we realized that the moment we were having any conversation about anything, we were into feelings conversations. And our experience was, if you don't talk about the feelings, 
and they leak out of people anyway. So people start to snap, I'm really busy, I'm working really hard, don't you understand? So you could say, have you got the report for Friday for the young person's review meeting? And you get a response like, I'm really busy, don't you care about me? Um, I'm in every day. Um, you know, uh, what about my family? Don't you care about my family? So we were kind of thinking, okay, um, we've got to do this differently. So everything was about feelings and then feelings became identity. So am I a good person? Am I competent? Am I incompetent? Um, am I, do you respect me? Um, what about my image? What about my self-dignity? What about my self-esteem? So I did a lot of work with our leadership team in particular, thinking about how we engaged in conversations with people. How do we support our teachers and staff so we can avoid these difficult conversations really, really quickly, okay? So feedback, and difficult conversations, uh, according to uh, Sheila Heen and Douglas Stone uh, in their book, which I really like, Feedback, um, Thanks for the Feedback, they say feedback's inevitable. You can't say I don't like feedback or I do like feedback. It's inevitable anyway. So we were finding that the difficult conversations were then leading to how do we feed back to our staff what we know about things? And um, according to Sheila Heen and, and Douglas Stone, feedback is in three categories. It's appreciation, which motivates and encourages people, i.e. thank you for coming in, even though we've got COVID. Thank you for coming in, even though you're supposed to be on holiday, we really appreciate it. Thank you for sleeping in the house groups on camp beds, we really appreciate it. Coaching is, look, um, these young people are having a tough time, we're all having a tough time. We work together. Um, let's let's work through this challenge. Let's meet this family together. Let's move to Zoom. Let's do a video call. You know that's coaching. I, you can get through this. Evaluation is that stuff around um, accuracy, feeding back to people on their performance and things. And a person will only work to their highest level of perceived value. We literally had to drop the idea of evaluation. Everybody felt evaluated all the time anyway. So we literally, as a leadership team, focused on coaching and appreciation. And that was what was motivating us, motivating people. So in order to do that, we had to think about the process of mentalization, the ability to understand the feelings of other people. And we had to think about reflective function, the ability to predict, predict the responses of other people because we knew that if we didn't support our staff and appreciate our staff properly, we were not gonna have anybody to work with the children. And they were not going anywhere. Schools across the UK closed, Cotswold Child School stayed open every day. We didn't close. And all the mental health teams, all the psychiatry teams, all the um, psychology team that are not employed by the trust, they all started working from home and they were available for video calls. But all of us and all of our staff, we were in every day and the teachers went to teach in the houses where the children live and the clinical staff went to work in the houses where the children live and they worked two days on and two days off. And we all did that um, in order to, to kind of keep that going. So recruitment, staff recruitment over COVID, we lost a higher number. We, we found it harder to recruit people before COVID. In the UK, Brexit hit, so we left Europe and we found it harder to recruit people in 2019. 2020, we were doing all, our, all of our recruitment over Zoom, as many of you were, I'm sure. Um, and we got better at it. So we could look at the application forms properly. We got much better at interview, interviewing people over Zoom. And we actually were able to recruit more staff during COVID than before COVID, which is unusual. Um, the next graph just basically uh, uh, details um, that, that data. So in order to put my talk together, uh, I, I thought about our, our values at the Trust. Okay, And we have a set of values that we try to adhere to that, um, that are kind of meaningful. They're not just on a brochure on the website. They're, they're meaningful values. And I thought I would put my work together framed around the values. Okay, So kindness was important for us, just being kind to people. 
So a lot of us have found the pandemic has led us to think more about what matters to us, what's important to us. Um, a national study in the UK uh, found that two thirds of people stated that this unprecedented time had made people kinder to one another. Perhaps because it was so difficult for everybody that people started to notice smaller things to take care of each other. So the idea of kindness was really important. So um, this is Mark and Tim, two colleagues. They and some young people did a huge banner to support the local NHS and nursing team. We made um, hampers for local nurses and the young people made soap and they made jams and we gave them out and they um, appreciated uh, what we did. We have something called Boys at the Workbench and we find teenage boys in particular really struggle to talk about any of their feelings or any of their emotions. They just act it out. So we've been running this for a, a long time and we contacted the, work, the Boys at the Workbench uh, workshop locally and we said can we still come the guys really need to come they really enjoy it and at the work at the boys at the workbench um, they make things for the community so this is a bench that they made for a local old people's home and this guy behind the bench is just a local guy who lost his wife a couple of years ago and he just comes in and works alongside our students and they just make things. At the moment, they're making a rocking horse for a local nursery group. And these are challenging young people. Um, these, these young people here um, are very challenging. They can be held quite frequently and things like that. So, you know, the idea of doing something creating, creative and giving something back is a sense of belonging and being and becoming as a group. And when they're making things, they're often talking about their anger, their frustrations, their feelings about things. Uh, rather than acting them out. So we also looked at kindness. What does it mean to be kind? So we're looking at altruistic kindness, which is just doing something because there's no reciprocal benefit. So if I'm at the local supermarket and I see somebody struggling with their shopping bags and I don't know them, I might help them with their shopping bags to the car. Um, there's nothing in it for me, essentially. It's not strategic kindness. Um, Strategic kindness, uh, both, both acts of kindness, whether it's altruistic or strategic, has a benefit on us. We feel better when we're kinder. So there's a re reciprocal benefit. All sorts of things happen in the cortex. You get flooded with all sorts of positive emotions around empathy and things like that. Um, but we did have to use strategic kindness for our own staff. We needed them to be at work. So we were kind and it was a uh, instrumental re uh, reciprocity, the idea of getting something back because we needed it. Um, we thought of empathy, and we all know what empathy is, but according to Dr. Bruce Perry, empathy uh, can't be taught, but it can be caught. So we can't teach people empathy, but we can take, pick it up from one another. So we were um, empathic towards people. Our values of curiosity. We were curious in our questions for young people. Um, we had we talked to them. We said, there's this thing called COVID. Um, lots of people are talking about it. Have you heard anything yourself? Uh, we're making some changes with the teaching and therapy. The, the therapists are going to be working in your home. How do you feel about that? And uh, you said you're worried about your family. Um, you're worried about COVID. Did you want to talk about it a bit more? And I know all of these things sound tremendously obvious, but it's often overlooked. And um, we use curiosity to try to get a sense of how people were, okay? Um, so for people who were, who were interested, um, this, is what, this is somebody who's from um, your neck of the woods, uh, Dr. Dan Hughes, I'm sure some of you are familiar with his work. I'm trained in DDP, I like DDP and um, he talked about connection before correction, which I think is fantastic around restraint reduction. Do not tell a young person off. Don't start to punish people or hold them to account when they don't even know you. There is no connection, so don't worry about that. Sorry, that'll ring off in a moment. Um, so we looked at creativity, okay, and we encouraged all of our staff to be creative. So in this next slide, go away, terrible phone call. Um, in this next slide, you can see this is our staff and young people 
uh, being creative. And Laurie, you'll like this, the parachute game. Uh, you know, that's one of your uh, approaches. Healthy human beings enjoy laughing, playing and having a good time. So um, that shared intimacy. And it's about the intersubjectivity, enjoying an experience together. And um, if, if you young, we found that if young people enjoyed the experience together, then they were enjoying it with attuned adults, they were being positive. Nice quote I like here around happiness. Remember that the happiest people are not those getting the most, but those that are giving the most. And I think that's a, a nice quote. So we got better at using Zoom and this next slide, these are our young people. They've all got COVID and they're all in their own homes and they're either in their bedrooms or they're in the lounge and they're just enjoying some online games, quizzes, and we're all involved in this. So, the, uh, you know, people within senior positions were logged on to this as well. It was good fun. And um, similarly, you know, you got the staff in full PPE and they're supporting a young person who um, has COVID and they're trying to play some games with him and try to keep him um, entertained and uh, just kind of trying to get through a difficult time. Uh, again, another picture. This was, this was a, a sort of quiz that, that somebody developed that we were all uh, trying to play online. Um, some of the kids there are particularly unwell. You can see they're in bed. <laughs> you know, they look quite rough, but they still wanted to engage and they still wanted to be part of what we were doing. One of my, one of my um, focuses was positivity. You've got to be positive with a difficult situation like this. This is our head of care or registered manager, Carolyn. She's probably one of the most positive and kind people you'll ever meet. I'm biased, but I think she's fantastic. And this is her on a holiday. She took all those girls that were in their bedroom with COVID when they were well and she was able to. She took them on holiday with a couple of staff uh, to the seaside and they had a great time. And we talk about hope and positivity. Janice, you talked about hope earlier. So hope is the ability to see a future that's better than the present and it's the power to try to make it happen. And so Bruce Perry talks about good leaders are a sponge. They soak up the rubbish and they prevent that affecting everyone else. Soak up the rubbish, don't amplify. Um, which I quite like. And a funny thing happens when leaders act in line with their values and principles, they typically uh, produce consistently high performances. So again, regulated leaders can regulate children and through co-regulation. So, um, you know, co-regulation is a biological imperative to try and regulate and help somebody working alongside children, helping them stay regulated when they're scared and anxious is a really important skill. They can then learn to self-regulate themselves. And we got feedback from young people after uh, and during COVID, we surveyed them wherever we could. And the staff members are always there when I need them. The staff care about me. Um, the staff have made me feel supported and helped me build some friendships. And what we also found is that 100% um, of our young people responded that they felt safe. Even though there was a global pandemic, they felt safe. The environment makes me safe and there's lots of staff and adults around that I trust. So those were important factors. Um, we used our support therapy dogs quite frequently. So they took young people out for walks and um, lots of young people mentioned that they used the phones to stay in touch with contact with family. They used uh, video calling and there were lots of comments about activities um, during the pandemic. So again, another slide of everybody pulling a face, messing around. Um, it's good to have a bit of fun. Um, and the creation of positive memories. Experiences become memories. Memories become reflective lenses and new sensations come in and they resonate with the memory and you respond accordingly. So our, our kind of idea is to create positive memories that are not naive, but positive memories. So I know this conference is primarily about restraint and um, the avoidance of restraint and seclusion and ideas around challenging behavior or behavior that challenges. What I've talked about, for some people might have seemed a little wishy-washy. It might be a bit kind of um, very much removed from what you're used to, okay? 
But I want to let I want to let everybody know. I want to reassure people that we have been on a massive restraint reduction journey at Cotswold Chine School. Okay, challenging behaviour or behaviour that challenges. Challenging for who? What is the person trying to tell me? What am I missing? Where do I need to be curious? Where do I need to be kind or positive? So this slide reflects the fact that in 2014, we were holding, we had 235 restraints in one month with all of our children. And we've only got 60 children. So we've got 42 residential and 18 day students and we were restraining them 235 times in one month in 2013, okay? And we thought we've got to do something about this. It isn't working, right? And, you know, we go up to 254, and then we then start to say, we need to learn, right? We got, we're, we're not doing the right stuff. We're, we need to learn much better. So we understand, we began to train in trauma theory. We began to understand what that means we began to embark on a huge journey of restraint reduction. Let's train and support our staff properly, okay? Let's give them the tools they need, because otherwise they're making it up, and they, if they make it up, they're getting it wrong, and it's not their fault, so how can we help, okay? So we went on a huge journey, as you can see. We may managed to bring our restraints down. We linked in with Kevin and Janice um, around 2016, and we were able to get their support, and we, you know, we went down again with their support around the six core strategies training. And then we, we, we just kept going with the training, more training, more reflective supervision, more guidance, more difficult conversations, more appreciation for people, you know, um, and we just kept going. Um, so we got from 254 um, and just before the pandemic, we came down to one restraint in a month. So, you know, we, we were holding children a lot. What's happened during COVID is very interesting that our figures of restraints came down during lockdown. So when the children were locked in their houses because we couldn't go out anywhere, we didn't hold them much. The relationships were really good. The clinical staff were in the homes. The best trained people were in the homes. Um, there were no transitions into school and back. There was no anxiety from children in minibuses and things like that. So basically we taught, we offered therapy in their own homes and the restraint figures came right down again. So again, it shows, for me, it shows the importance of positive relationships, training, and your best people. You're only as good as your newly qualified person who doesn't know anything. <laughs> so, so again, uh, de-escalation, this is something we created. So we have a circle of de-escalation techniques. Every week we work out what's been good and then we feed it back into the data. These strategies work this week, and then we're going to feed it into our meetings. We're going to feed it back into the staff. We're going to do the training around it. We're going to have live data, what works every week. And then we send out posters to children near miss. The escalation successes. What's working at the time? What are young people having trouble with at the moment? Well, they're missing their families. They're struggling with the changes. They're bored. So we can send out these posters regularly, letting everybody know. What, what the sort of temperature is on the ground. And then we can also send out a list of what might be helpful. We also promote supervision, staff spending time with young people. We never seclude children. We never send them to their bedrooms. Their bedroom's the only place that's theirs. Why would you send a child to their bedroom when it's the only place they've got that's theirs? To have those difficult thoughts oh, about yeah. why they can't be part that's of the group. I'm gonna forget what one I'm on. Sorry? Oh, sorry. Um, and so basically, you know, we really push the idea of supervision. Supervision is seen as a gift, not a punishment. Time in, not time out. That's a theme we use a lot. Um, and we don't isolate children. If you isolate children, they can't work out what they've done wrong. Because if they could work out what they've done wrong, they wouldn't need to be isolated. So you need to stay with them and help repair the relationship think through the conflict, think through the problem, um, use invitational language to try and understand, to be curious what's going on and reinforce the relationship. We really love having you as part of the group, but when you threw the jam jar across the table, it frightened everybody and we just can't have that. So let's go and talk about that. So 
We don't remove children because if we remove children from the social group, it's the same, it's a sense of abandonment. It's that early biological need to be connected to somebody and you're just reminding everybody that they're not part of the social group. So we don't isolate people. Kids have a fear of separation. So um, as I move in towards the end of my presentation, um, Chronicles of COVID, Lessons Learned. These are dolls. Um, some of you may recognize my doll there as with the orange trousers and the glasses and the bald patch at the front. Um, these dolls were made by one of our secretaries. Um, she loves to knit and she just came in one day and said, I've made you as a doll, Jake. Do you like it? And I thought, my goodness, this is really odd. Um, I checked to see if there were any pins in it, but there's not. So that's good. But um, and she just made everybody. So Carolyn, that's head of care, who's eating the ice cream, there she is on the left next to me. And so um, we've got these dolls around the place and uh, everybody really likes them. So lessons learned. We started with hope. OK, hope is an optimistic um, viewpoint um, and it has a direct correlation to um, good outcomes in the face of adversity. The importance of hope linked to the activation in the singular cortex, top part of our brain, the belief part, the thinking part of our brain. OK, that's where we haze our belief systems. So if we can, hope lives in our belief systems at the top of the cortex. So if we can access the cortex, we'll be OK. Um, we were inspected by our regulators during COVID. They were not interested in COVID. The inspection team turned up and we had all our folders out everywhere. We were walking around with masks on, we were showing we were PPE'd and they just wanted to know if children were reading properly, had they made progress in their academic achievements. They were not interested in COVID. And Tim, who's our principal, he's a great guy. He turned around to the lead inspector and he said, been here every day, mate, during COVID. And the inspector said, yeah, so have I, next. That was it, wasn't interested in COVID. Just wanted to know if, if the children were making academic progress. And luckily they were. And so we've had lots of inspections during COVID and our work's been uh, validated as out, outstanding for children, which is, which is great. Um, the, the, you'll see in the handouts, this is the data around people that contracted COVID. So we did have 65% at one time, 65% of our staff team had COVID, tested positive for COVID, um, certainly at Cotswold China School. And at William Morris College in Paradise House, um, we had 42 people and um, that tested uh, positive for COVID. So, you know, we had quite a bit of COVID around the place at different times. Um, there's a, there's, I think um, uh, Kevin may well be talking about this, so I don't want to preempt it. But the great resignation is the idea that whatever the situation is, I want better. So staff recruitment is a global problem, especially doing this type of work. And... One thing I said recently, which um, was that it took a global pandemic for people to recognize and realize that health professionals and carers actually do a good job. You know, wh why the hell wasn't it noticed before? Why did it take a global pandemic for people to go, oh, care work's really important. Looking after children's really important. Um, education's really important. Why the hell do people have to die for that? But there's a positive. The positive is that the world has recognized that care professionals and education uh, is important. And we all do an important job. I'm a, still a practitioner. I still meet families. I still meet kids. And I think it's very important. Um, within our own staff team, we have 278 staff, as I said earlier. And um, I, I think, uh, well, we've got 33 staff have been um, here over 10 years, 19 staff over 15 years. 10 staff have been with us over 25 years, nine staff um, and seven staff have been with us between 25 and 50 years of service at the one place. And we don't use agency staff. We all step in and help where we need to. And we're very creative and creating roles for people that work. And um, that's so basically, um, you know, there is a difference. I've, I'm hoping that we will get more people interested in care work in the UK since the pandemic, because people will see there's a value. It's moral work, it's important work, and it's purposeful work. And so I'm hoping we'll get there. We are not short of our own problems. Uh, this is my view from my desk. And I called this the faces at the office window because I saw lots of people come and go past my office window who I didn't know because we were in lockdown and we were in 
uh, COVID bubbles, we were not allowed to mix. And I feel very sad that I don't know all those people because they came to work for us and some of them I still haven't met yet. I can just see them as faces at the window. Um, we realized that um, we needed, what we learned about our clinical staff and teachers in the homes is that we need to train the staff much, much, much better in the homes to know what it means to be resilient, to know what it means to, to understand trauma and attachment. So I created seven new job roles for people. I advocate this role. They're called training and practice supervisors. Their role is to take everything we say we do and apply it to the houses where it's needed. To coach, work alongside people, to appreciate people, to really guide people on those first few days of joining, this is what the work is. So final thoughts. Um, we worked out at the start of the pandemic that nobody was going to rescue us. And that was a hard thought to come to. There's no one going to fly in and take care of everybody. Information overload and then nothing. So plot your own course is what I would say. Uh, the importance of the remembering self and the experiencing self. How we remember it. If you, if you go to... Uh, you go to a fantastic concert to watch a brilliant band and a few minutes towards the end, I don't know, maybe there's, um, there's a lot of shouting and things. Um, and you come back and somebody says, what was the concert like? You might say it was terrible. There's was all the shouting. But the shouting was at the end. You know, you had a really good evening before that bit happened. So we're trying to encourage our staff to think about things and experience things slightly differently, you know. Um, it's important to be hopeful and positivity, to think about how you stay self-regulated yourself. Um, the young people, I think our young people have coped with so much adversity in their own lives, whether they were neglected or early childhood adversity, neglect, abuse, domestic violence, any of these very, very challenging early life experiences. I think for, for some of them, COVID was absolutely nothing. I think it's nothing for them. And I'm, I'm impressed every day that some of our young people can actually be bothered to go to school. Because I think if I experienced some of what they have experienced in their early childhoods, um, I'm not sure I would be as positive about life as they are. So I think some of our young people just got on with it, you know? Um, anyway, that's my view. Um, so uh, there's gaps in knowledge uh, between what we say we do and what we really do. Um, there was a shift in recruitment and support. So we really need to focus on appreciating our staff, not evaluating them all the time. Um, difficult conversations uh, were nearly always about identity. So if I literally asked somebody a question about anything, they thought I didn't care about them. So I needed to flip that and tell people I did appreciate what they were doing. I do care about you, but can I just ask you about something? Hope, kindness, and gratitude and a sense of moral purpose. And um, if there's an act, this is my belief, okay, and uh, our data kind of suggests it, but um, if there's an active drive to promote training and support and good relational health, you can create a culture that acts as a protective factor in the face of adversity. And it then equips people with the skills to stay self-regulated, positive, and ultimately avoid the use of restrictive practices. I, I believe that 100%. Um, so I'll have time for questions, uh, but the, I, I always like to finish with these two characters I call the knower and the doer. And basically there's lots of people you will come into contact with doing this type of work that are knowers. They often base themselves in lovely offices like mine and they can solve every problem, but they are reluctant to get involved in practice and they're reluctant to get involved in meeting people and then you have the doer and that's the person who flies around really busy really hectic trying to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do and with these two people we often forget the most important person the knowing doer so it's a kind of philosophical way of thinking about how do we bridge the gap between people that know stuff and people that are doing stuff. And the aim for all of us is to create the team of knowing doers, if we can. And that's what I strive to achieve at Vivarda's Trust. Finally, 
I talked about this earlier. It's the remembering self and the experiencing self. It's not what's wrong with you, it's what's happened to you. It's a popular phrase, I know. But Carl Jung said, um, I am not what happened to me. I am what I choose to become. So again, final questions. Are we coping with COVID? Did we cope with COVID? So, so um, I'd like to hand over now to see if there's any questions that anybody would like to ask me. Um, would that be okay? Janice, anybody? Please do. Oh, I finished early. <laughs> so we. Okay, uh, um, this is Kevin. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what you know in the in the United States? We've literally lost thousands of workers, and I can't think of any setting that escaped. Um, can you talk a little bit about? why you think that you did lose some staff, but it wasn't as significant or it wasn't as big um, in, at Cotswold Chime that it was in many of our facilities? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think as a leadership team, we are all practitioners. And I think that's very, very important. That I'm the chief executive and you know I run a big organization, but I meet families and I meet kids regularly. And I think we like to lead like that, and that's what we do. And I think when things got tough pretty quick, we literally got involved in working alongside our own staff. And I think because our own staff were able to see that we were get we were mucking in and and uh, you know doing what we could to support, I think that prevented people from leaving and giving up because I think they felt supported that we we were all in this together, like a sense of camaraderie. And then I think as um, often what happens is skilled practitioners are promoted to a level of their own incompetence. And so they go up and up and up and then they get into a lovely office and then they don't see any kids anymore. And then nobody learns because nobody has any contact with them anymore. And so I think we've got people who are incredibly skilled that they stepped in to work. That gave the staff on duty confidence. That, that encouraged them to stay and hang in there. And I really think that prevented them leaving. And I think that was one element to it. And I think another element to it is that um, we are incredibly cre creative. So if we can't recruit care staff because nobody wants to be a care worker, we'll create a new role. And it's called the youth support worker, right? And your role is to be on shift, uh, getting the kids as active as you can. Play football, go bike riding, go swimming, cook tea, settle them for bed. Sounds like a care worker, but it's not. It's a youth support worker and we want you to be creative. And we attracted loads of people. And then we then thought, well, we've got a lot of clinical staff. They need assistance. Let's create a role called a clinical therapy assistant. And we were inundated with people who want to be clinical therapy assistants. And they all work on duty. And I think because everybody does that, it prevented people leaving. I think so. And showing appreciation for people. If, if you think, this is my mantra, if you think care works easy, you're not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, thanks, Kevin. Thanks. Um, I feel like as a, a person who works with students in this um, area, there are times that staff are still coping or not even recognizing some of the trauma issues that they have or mental issues. So do you think that, um, have you seen staff kind of, kind of um, growing mentally through what you guys were doing at your facility? Do you think it, it helped them develop some of the skills that they maybe or um, behaviors they didn't recognize in themselves because i feel like that's a huge um that makes a huge difference too yeah that's a good question i i, I definitely think you know um if you think about all of the things i talked about and I, I didn't go into great detail but if you think about the concept of hope uh, being playful um uh, being positive um uh, being creative being curious those those all have an impact on you as a person so um, Rudolf Steiner, who I started off talking about, he, he sort of said once, um, if you're not actively supporting the development of another person, 
you, then you're not developing yourself. And I think that if you engage in these things, if you play the parachute game, if you go on activities, if you go on bike rides with kids, you, you're getting so much back. You're quite enjoying it. So you kind of feel like this is OK. And I think those protective factors that are in there for the children uh, are then in there for the staff as well. And I think they're feeling good because they're enjoying their work. Um, and of course, you know, if, if you're in an environment, I mean, you know, we were we were 250 something restraints in one month. That's people being hurt, that's staff holding kids, that's not nice, right? That's paperwork, that's debriefings, that's what went wrong. Um, that's not a great place to be. So if you can get right down in your restraints, <clears throat> then people want to work for you because nobody wants to come to work to wrestle kids to the ground. Um, people want to have fun and have a good time. The other thing we offered was reflective supervision. And that's not line management stuff. That's tell me how you're doing, how you're feeling, how are you okay? And it's not recorded, there's no minutes. It's just uh, do you need anything from us? Um, are you are you coping okay with this stuff? And that's massively helpful in any organization. Because if your line manager asks you, are you okay? Are you coping? You're not sure whether to be honest. Um, if I say I'm not coping, are you going to promote someone else? So I'm going to pretend I'm coping and then it's going to leak out of my behavior anyway. So I think reflective supervision with no strings attached is really important. So, thank you. Um, anybody else got any comments or questions or anything they'd like to know a bit, bit more about? No? That's okay. Dana has put your presentation um, link in the chat so people can download it. Um, just an amazing presentation though. Oh, thank you, Jones. <laughs> fabulous, fabulous work. And um, so much for us to take home and mull over and uh, make it real right here in Massachusetts. This is great. What, what I would say is um, I've been out there a couple of times, really enjoyed it. I'd love to come back again, Janice. There's a big hint for you. And um, any, anybody that uh, reads anything in the presentation that they want to know any more about or they want to comment on, then my email address is at the end. Please feel free to send me an email. I'd be very happy to reply to everything. And, um, you know, I don't want it to sound overly woolly and fluffy, but we really do believe that if you promote positive relationships, you can avoid holding people i i do that i agree um i really believe that so thank you thank you jake thanks so much okay we'll move on to kevin jake has to stop sharing so i can Can everybody see that? Yay me. Even after two and a half years, I still mess this up sometimes. So anyway, good morning, everyone. I know a lot of you. Uh, my name's Kevin, and I've spent a lot of time in Massachusetts over the last 22 years working with Janice and our other colleagues. So it's always a pleasure to um, be back with you all. And so what... I'm going to take a pretty different tack than, than what Jake just did. And this is intentional um, because I spent two and a half years in very different situations than um, Jake did and probably a lot of you. Um, when COVID came, I was working in Alaska and um, we first started hearing about it. In, um, in, in Washington State and Oregon um, because people were traveling from Asia. And so pretty quickly, um, I was in a hospital there, this, the Alaska Psychiatric Institute. And so probably within three months, most of us had been flown home and grounded. 
And so um, we kind of, that, that, was the, that was the time in COVID, which I think was probably the most terrifying for everyone because we had no idea what we were dealing with. We had no idea what it was. There were no vaccines. There were no PPE. Um, no one really do, knew what to do. And so during that six months, I think um, that first six to eight months, we all learned about Zoom. We all learned about Teams. We all um, started to learn about PPE. Um, we started trying to figure out, you know, how to move from being completely shut down in our clinical settings to opening up a little bit more. And about that time, I went back out and started working in, I was still working for corrections. And so I was uh, mostly in detention centers. And that was a very interesting experience that I'll talk a bit about later um, uh, because that's such a artificial environment um, and often scary. And then the last year, a little bit more than a year, I actually have been working for Recovery International, working to set up Crisis Now services, which are partners with the 988 Go Live in July 18th. And for those of you who haven't heard about 988, um, please Google some stuff because it's critically important. It's going to very much change our behavioral health system in the US. And just as a brief um, update, the 988 system is parallel to the 911 system in the United States. 911 came about in the late 1960s and um, to, to basically respond to people that were either in a medical crisis or a public safety uh, incident or issue. And so responders were basically police and EMS. And that system, again, um, slowly got adopted in every part of the United States. So now you, if any of us call 911, someone's gonna answer the phone and someone's gonna come see us probably. So for the last many years, as you all know, people in behavioral health crisis started getting responded to by the 911 system. And because there was no one else to call. And as we all know, the mix of law enforcement and people in behavioral health crises often ends in tragedy. And we've all heard of those outcomes over the last couple of years. So um, the Su National Suicide Prevention Hotline has really started up um, politicking and lobbying Congress to give us a behavioral health second line. Um, that would be either, it was going to be 222, 922, and it turned out to be 988, and it goes live in July, and that means that anywhere in the country, if you dial 988, someone's going to pick up the phone, hopefully, although some states are lagging behind in, in development, but eventually someone will pick up the phone, you will be able to talk to a trained behavioral health carer on the phone. If you need more than that, you will be greeted with mobile crisis. And if you need more than that, you will be brought to a rapid crisis stabilization and assessment center, um, generally under 23 hours so that you can be worked with. So that's what I've been doing in the last year in Maryland, um, Maryland, Virginia, Ohio, and Delaware. And so I have a, I, I really received a breadth of information and experience during this pandemic. So that's what I wanted to share a little bit about um, today, about what we learned. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the challenges that emerged in the current pandemic, um, action steps um, should, that should we experience, you know, hopefully this goes away, but my guess is, and according to many in the CDC and other um, National Institutes of Health, this is not the last pandemic we're going to see. And then a little bit about seclusion and restraint use during the pandemic. The first thing I wanna to say to all of you is thank you. Um, you're still here. And we've all gone through this together. I don't think we felt very together, especially at the beginning. I think we were scared and we didn't know what to do and we weren't getting very good information, just like Jake talked about. 
Um, it went from no information to too much information um, and back and forth, um, no PPE to a million kinds of PPE. So you didn't know which worked and which didn't. Um, we, it, it's truly been the hardest two, two and a half years of my entire career. Um, I think what we've learned is that you are heroes. Um, I heard a statement yesterday that if you save a life, you get the title hero. But if you save a hundred lives, you should have the title carer because that's what we do every single day. So talking to you again is an honor. Um, and the fact that you guys are still here, you're still working, you're still doing it every single day. You basically have lived through all those things I just talked about, the great resignation. Um, we're all working uh, virtually, um, even though many times some of our colleagues looked like they were mowing the lawn or shopping, um, especially at the beginning. Um, and then the actually, I am working virtually, but I don't know how to use Zoom or Teams or Basecamp or Trello or Google Meet or Ring Central, and everybody was kept changing um, their, their, their uh, platforms. That was very difficult because then you just feel stupid. So it has been a very difficult year. And I think um, even in spite of, of all this, we have learned some really great skills. And, and part of that Lori's going to talk about, which is building resilience. Um, part of it is just competencies that I think probably none of us ever knew that we'd even have to have. So what I'm going to talk about are PPE, working from home, virtual management of staff, telehealth, recruitment and retention issues, uh, vaccines, um, emotional needs of staff, seclusion and restraint, and a little bit about resiliency because I don't want to steal any of Lori's um, unbelievable work. So one of the th first things I learned about when, when COVID came about was that for decades, and this is, I mean, I probably many of you knew this, I didn't, but one of my neighbors is from China. And she told me that for decades, people in Asia had worn masks on planes and grocery stores in the marketplace, um, be, just through flu season and cold season. And that everyone does it, it's no big deal. And I thought, oh my God, that's like brilliant. And so one of the things I noticed, and I, I did kind of a survey, is most people did not get the cold or flu over the last two years. Why? Because we were wearing masks. That's probably 99.9% .9 of the reason. So I think that's important information and learning for us going forward. And I can tell you that as far as I am concerned, I will be still wearing masks in the grocery store. Um, and on planes, regardless of what the rules are. I think we also need to have a stockpile of PPE at home and at work. This will not be the last pandemic. Um, and as you all remember, nothing was available. Um, when people really started to understand what was going on, the supermarkets empty. And it literally took months to order stuff online. So, just going forward, just like if, you know, like I grew up in Florida and every single year we would prepare for hurricanes. It's the same kind of thing. Have a go kit. Have, don't wait to do it when it's announced. Have it already. And make sure that your environment and care is the same. Um, there's enough room, I'm sure, to stockpile some of this stuff and don't slack on it. Even with all that, I did get COVID twice in the last year. Um, vaccines work. It was like having a bad cold. It wasn't fun, but I didn't end up in the ICU. And I saw this over and over and over again with some of my colleagues. So, um, and that, that's an important lesson that I think we need to continue to talk about because I think one of the, one of the issues that disturbed me the most was the outright lies on social media about vaccines and the fact that we in the United States did not do a very good job um, mediating that. So working from home 
is obviously something that many of us had to do. Um, there was a whole group of us, I mean, not me, luckily, but there's a whole group of our colleagues that couldn't go to work because they had pre-existing conditions or disease states that made them extremely high risk, okay? Um, but I think it's really important that when we do work from home, we take it as seriously as we used to when we work, went into work. I don't think it man, uh, matters if you're a manager or not. Um, I think it's important for morale and for mood to look the same on Zoom as you would in an office. Wearing your PJs may seem okay, but it can affect your attitude and motivation for work. And I think being self-disciplined is really important, again, for mood and resiliency. Um, I noticed that when I got stuck at home, and I am not a person that ever would want to work from home, I still miss going to the office a lot. Um, I got kind of depressed. And it just, it, everything felt so surreal. Um, and it was really hard. And I'll be really honest, there were times where I had my pajamas on at the very beginning, or I, I would just throw a shirt on. <laughs> and, 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 but it, that didn't help. And it really took me a couple months to think, we gotta, we, we gotta do everything we can to try and make our lives normal. Um, minimize distractions if you're working from home. Yes, my dog has demanded to be on my lap, which has been nightmarish sometimes, especially if I'm presenting. Um, it took a little while, uh, and but now you know we have her down to her doggy daycare, and my husband and I take turns, or we send her to the neighbors, or occasionally she just sit in my lap and I adjust my camera, and take breaks from your computer screen. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to that. Um, either developed carpal tunnel, permitting work at the computer screen, or headaches. Um, I strongly um, have heard recommendations from almost every um, every um, organization that I've been in over the last couple of years to help staff or encourage staff to get standing up desks. Um, what a difference. Uh, if you can stand for half the day, um, really helps. And again, this is in our power and in our employer's power. I um, mean, it's worth it. It's worth every penny. Um, even if you can just put your your computer up on a box, um, it's it's really helpful, guys. And and it really worked for a lot of staff, both at work that were actually on site or at home. Trying virtual virtual management staff who are actually at work when when one of when we're not when the actual employer or the manager is not is really really difficult. And I was really interested to hear Jake talk about the fact that he thinks that one of the reasons that they didn't lose as many staff as I certainly saw leaving employment um, was because his executive team was all there. In, during this last two and a half years, I've worked at at least three facilities for a significant amount of time where what we call the C-suite had vanished. They had just vanished. And you could tell by the moral, morale of the staff that were actually on site. So obviously, if you have medical risks, you are going to have to just do everything you can and you're not going to be able to be there. But if you don't, it's so important to at least be there as much as you can. Um, if you're not, you if not being on, you know, Zoom is great. And yes, you can do a lot um, in telehealth. But when you're a manager in time of a, of a crisis, you you really won't know what your staff need. It's hard to get a pulse on morale. You can't really check in, pull someone aside, um, have those kind of hopeful conversations, um, what people's emotional triggers are. Um, and we know that when people start to get stressed, we get less safe. 
And that goes for both the people we serve and the staff we're trying to serve them. And that's where we started to see the increase pretty much nationally in the use of seclusion and restraint. Because when people are so stressed and so worried and, it, and exhausted, our thresholds for our, for our triggers, our emotional triggers lowers and we get triggered a lot more easily. And so do the people we serve. And when you add to that all the rules that came down and the fact that most of us don't have outside areas to go to um, or gardens or things like that, um, it became just a never ending cycle of um, crisis, staff calling out, not having enough staff, and then having emotional issues occur on, on our, on our, in our healthcare environments. Another issue that arose very quickly, and this was in one of my states actually in Delaware, um, where we have a number of sites, is that when staff went home, we found out a lot of staff didn't have computers at home. And most of us leaders had never even thought of that. We just assumed that everybody had one or two computers at home and they didn't. So they couldn't do on, on, online training and they couldn't do assignments. And they, couldn't, they couldn't do Zoom. Um, and we had to rapidly figure out what to do for that. And in most cases that is on the employer because if staff don't have computers, it's generally either a financial issue or they don't have uh, Wi-Fi. Um, so don't over assume that your staff have the ability to work from home. Um, I think it's also really important that if staff don't have computers at home, that we don't do anything that might shame them. Um, in reality, if a, if a staff person doesn't, you know, we, we are going to have to basically figure out a way to engage them and to get them so that they feel like they're equal and being able to be a full member of the team, um, just like their, their colleagues. Um, <sighs> recruitment and retention. Um, this was really a nightmare and it actually started in the correctional settings um, when, I, when I was working, that, that was in that first year. We, what we noted was that people just stopped coming back to work. Um, I have never seen anything like this before where sometimes people didn't even bother to resign. They just didn't come back to work. And we lost an, a lot of staff. Um, <clears throat> in the crisis now sites that I'm managing, we had to shut down a couple programs because when you have no nurses, you have to shut down. Um, one of those sites stayed closed for four months um, because even with agency and even with paying $160 an hour for an RN in the Northeast, we couldn't find them. And even though we had our baby, I were night nurses. And I even went up and worked shifts, um, which was pretty scary because I haven't worked shifts in a long time. Um, so I had to rapidly learn an electronic health record. I had to rapidly learn on the cell. Um, and, and we rapidly started hiring LPNs. But again, we needed, an, we needed RNs on site. Um, and so um, this, was something that I think took everybody by surprise <clears throat> because we were so busy working and we were so busy just trying to cover shifts, keep safe, get sleep, that I think we lost contact, especially in that first year and a half with our staff. And we didn't, we didn't do the thoughtful things that Jake talked about in many cases. We didn't know to do it. So it's not like, I'm not, I don't think we can blame anybody. If we just didn't, had never gone through anything like this before. So people just stopped coming to work. Um, also what happened in some states, not all, 
is it states mandated that all workers, whether state workers or private not for profit vendor, you know, contractor workers had to be vaccinated. And that came as a shock. And I think that's when we found out how many staff had not gotten vaccinated and were not going to get vaccinated. And they left. Um, when I was in the correctional system um, in North Carolina, they all they had a 30% vacancy rate going into COVID. So they very simply just locked everyone down. And it was pretty horrific to see that because people in prison and in detention centers are already locked down enough, but they usually get to go to the gym, they get to mingle, they get to go to um, the, the kitchen area, you know, the food service area for, for, for food. They often, there's often outdoor areas to go to and all that got locked down. Um, and there was much more anger and violence in those settings than I had ever seen before. And the same thing on a little, a smaller rate happened in our behavioral health settings. And I don't think we were prepared for this at all. Um, and so it took us a little while to wake up. And what finally did work were some pretty hefty sign-on bonuses, salary, salaries being increased by probably 30% in some cases. And this is what this is, I had a real mixed feeling about this. As a manager, I was terrified about the budgets because the states that we get funded through um, don't, they don't have all this money laying around. They can't afford to reimburse us, especially when it's not in the contract for these salaries and these, these, these agency workers that are making an incredible amount of money. Um, so that was <clears throat> pretty scary. But on the other hand, I was actually thrilled to see finally that peer support staff who were basically making in most of the areas in the country, 12, 13, $14 an hour, which is not a living wage, are now up to 17, 18, 19, and 20. I'm sorry it took COVID for that to happen, but it did and it's happened. I also saw increases in nursing salaries. And as a nurse, it's about time. Um, nurses are critical for our work. And so are social workers and psychologists and everybody else. Now, don't get me wrong, but and speaking personally um, and watching, you know, the, the nurses I had to train, I was just glad that in general, our salaries went up in behavioral health. Um, and I guess we're just going to have to sort all this out at the end of the day on who's going to pay for it. So we also um, saw that flexible hours worked, and many facilities went from eight hour shifts to 12 hour shifts. Um, I personally have only worked a 12 hour shift a few times in my life. So I didn't know how that was going to be experienced. But again, people are resilient. And having, you know, three days on and four days off, I think really helped retain staff. Shortening new employee orientation, using online server systems, um, but keeping it live not just having people watch a bunch of tape stuff. I think that really helped us to onboard quicker. So instead of a five day orientation, two and a half, and then you do the rest on, on site. Um, and then finally, um, nursing was so low, um, med assistants and paramedics in parts of the country proved to be extremely helpful. It required the state to do some pretty rapid rule changes or waivers, but it definitely kept open a number of facilities that probably would have closed. So that was really helpful. Vaccines. Um, we're not done with vaccines yet. And I think <clears throat> considering the fact that, again, we're not over COVID-19, and I think we need to prepare for the next. I think we, as leaders, need to role model getting vaccines or boosters. We need to celebrate that on our social media. We need to talk about it in public. Um, I'm not saying get in arguments with people about social media. Just speak your own truth. 
Um, tell your own story. You can be low key. Low key. Vaccines are safe and effective. Um, just, I think we all, as healthcare staff, definitely need to um, use our power to help educate. And I think that's really important. Um, and, and, you know, I think every day we learn a little bit more about vaccines, we learn a little bit more about these, these odd viruses. And I think it's just important that we keep talking about that um, for the next time, um, because so many people died that didn't need to die. So now I'm gonna talk a minute about our um, protecting and, and helping staff um, supporting their emotional needs. Again, it took a good eight months for us to figure this out and to try and start to, to, to stem the tide of the great resignation. Um, what worked for the, I worked for two, um, in this, during this time, these both companies I worked for were very big and they're in most of the other states in the US so that we were on you know, three time zones during, during um, daylight savings time, we were on four time zones. And so um, we all kind of learned together. But what really worked were, first of all, virtual wellness groups. Um, what I mean by that is um, in, in, at WellPath, for instance, the, the organization I was working for that, that's a lot correctional, um, we brought together all the clinical psychologists and social workers. And we, we had a small group of about nine that were interested in doing this. And we started running 15 to 30 minute wellness groups two or three times a week um, at noon. And we and what would happen is everybody would have the the uh, link, and so anybody who wanted to, nobody took attendance, nobody really took names down or anything. You could just sign in, and someone on the screen, one of our clinical um, professionals, would lead us through some kind of exercise, whether self awareness, relaxation. Um, some of us were trained through Lori's social resilience strategies. So we started doing some of that, sometimes just talking and answering questions. Um, we also started having town hall meetings every single week, where our two lead medical directors who were tied into the CDC would get online and update everybody on COVID, vaccinations, side effects, and kind of just evidence-based practice. And that really <coughs> helped to quell uh, the, the the rumors and people being scared and stuff like that. And, and, you know, we talked through which PPE worked and we talked through, you know, what tests work and how we should be monitoring people coming in and out of work um, and not going over the top and um, those kind of things. So that was that those town halls were really helpful. Posting our e e EAP contact information over and over and telling managers to make it normal to contact EAP, to make sure you checked your own EAP and you called the number to make sure someone even answered the phone because we found a lot of that too, that people couldn't get in contact with EAP. And usually by the time a staff member has talked themselves into contacting EAP, they need to talk to someone and they can't get no one answering on the line. Um, training our managers to watch for emotional distress in our staff and take action, not wait, not feel like they were intruding. Teaching them how to kindly and respectfully just ask the question, to have the courage to share that, that manager, to share if they had also had to contact the EAP or an outside mental health professional. Because it takes courage to do that with your own colleagues, to say, you know, I needed help a couple months ago, um, and to just share that and not worry about it. Um, having virtual or on-site staff meetings more frequently. Um, to me, that meant, you know, every week. And now we're at every 10 days or every, every other week. And just keeping a pulse on that and trying to have fun with it. Um, 
you know, playing funny videos, um, playing games, using Mentimeter, which is this cool tool that I'm sure you guys know about where you can answer, the whole group can answer a question and it all comes up in all these words on the screen. Um, having everybody have a tea party together, even if they're sitting at home. Um, we had cocktail hour with people sitting at home that weren't at work. We did all, we tried to do all kinds of things. And then the same thing on site, we'd send in pizzas and things like that. And then check in with staff that you know are facing difficult situations, some different managers or even different colleagues so that it, no one gets overwhelmed. And it's very easy to get quickly overwhelmed. I mean, at one point, I think I had 10 staff who had people in their family sick with COVID, um, a couple of them in the ICU. And there was no way I could contact every one of those staff every single day. So we, I just identified other staff to do that. So people felt like they were being kept in touch with. Um, being sensitive. Um, again, I, I'm a big one for listening to people's stories, giving people the respect and attention to just listen to their stories. Everybody, every one of us has stories to tell. And how often do we get to do that in our busy lives? So again, during a crisis, listening to stories really seem to be really um, important. Difficult years for seclusion and restraint. Um, I personally had a very different uh, experience than what Jake talked about. Uh, we saw an awful lot more seclusion and restraint um, at Bridgewater. Still nothing like it was when we took over, but it went up. I was, it, it went up um, because everybody was shut down. Nobody could have visitors. We couldn't have any of the shared times and spaces we used to have. No one could go to the gym. Um, same thing in, in, in the programs I'm running now. Um, you know, people just were shut down and shut in. Um, we didn't have a lot of, um, we didn't have a lot of equipment and supplies at first. And staff had to get really, really, really creative. Um, I think that when we shut down our freedom of movement, we did it for safety. I think we've learned something about that. Um, now, and I think we've also learned something about educating the people we serve about what was going on probably better than that. Um, so, you know, I think we learned a lot and, and we, we did the best we could and that's, that has to be good enough. Um, I'm hopeful that we can take these lessons learned and remember that um, if we take care of our staff, they're going to have a better time taking care of the people they care for every day. And in that environment, we will probably have less risk for escalating behaviors. Um, so again, I think it, we're just having to get back to where we were before COVID and take our learning and our lessons and just redouble our efforts. And then role modeling resiliency. <clears throat> Obviously, everybody on this in this training today has incredible resiliency. And there are ways to continue to build that resiliency. It's not, it's not like there's only so much resiliency. You can continue to build it just like a muscle. So share with your staff and family and friends what you're doing to stay healthy. And if you're only working, you're not and you're not having any fun, pay attention to that because that's going to take a toll at some point. You may be so healthy that it hasn't taken a toll yet, but it's going to. So figure out, you know, that one of the great things about COVID was now there's all these online cooking classes that you can take with like real cooks, like chefs that you read about. Um, gardening, exercise. Most people can now go back to the gym. You can certainly do stuff outside. Um, fantasy football, adult coloring books playing golf because you're outside, horseback riding, which is my new kid, hiking, card games, whirl, walking your dog and talking to the neighbors and just walking, get a hobby. Um, teach your kids and families and, and, and friends um, to do the same by just watching you and talking about it. Um, because again, I think the, the, the pandemic certainly brought me much more in touch with my need to have fun because I was one of those kind of workaholics that um, really mostly just work. And so this was a good, uh, 
and, and learning from people like Lori was also incredibly helpful um, to, to really understand that it is a responsibility to not just work and to get good sleep. So I'm going to end there. I'm going to try and um, bring up this, this very short video. I am going to warn you and apologize. It's kind of rests somewhere in between salty and profane, but certainly nothing you have never heard before. Um, and it, it's, um, and I want you also to just take note of the URL because um, you can Google it if this doesn't work and it is really funny. So I think anybody who has been working um, in a hospital or residential type setting um, and, and anybody who has experience with Joint Commission through COVID will find this um, funny. And again, I apologize if, if, I, if I somehow don't, can't figure out how to bring this up. So I think we're crowding the restart time, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right, Dana? How are we doing? Yes, we, we are just a, a moment overdue to return. I think okay. people will live with their few moments of freedom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's take it away from them right now. Okay. All right, so if everybody's back and everybody's ready, let me pass on to Lori. Okay, so hello everybody. I'm so glad to be here. I was really looking forward to having this time last year. We presented at the forum, I guess it was last year. Jake and I, that was the first time I'd met Jake. So a wonderful uh, friendship came out of that. And you know, certainly having Kevin, who I spent the last year with in, in our Train the Trainer program, uh, wonderful to have the three of us doing this together. So yeah, so I wanted to start out um, with just a little overview because let me uh, do my screen share here. Let's see if maybe I'm, uh, there I am. And I'll put it on here, there, okay. And so I'm going to be talking to you today about the neuroscience of amplifying strengths. And I'm, let me just move this down to the bottom. And the ecology of resilience. I don't know if you all remember uh, this fellow in the United States that got a lot of um, recognition in the late 80s. I think it was Yuri Bronfenbrenner is his name. And he wrote about ecological approaches to things. And I remember it was just as I was coming out of graduate school and I was so excited by his work and the idea of thinking ecologically. And so um, when I was thinking about this presentation for you all, I thought it would be helpful to um, take a sort of wider lens and look at the ecology of resilience um, and how we can think about that as a frame for amplifying strengths in organizations and, and in uh, people. And so let's see which one of these I hit to get it to advance. No, it's not advancing. Any suggestions, Dana, about how to get this? Bottom. Oh, wait, I'll do this arrow, yeah, okay. So before, let me take that back because before I ask you your test questions, I just wanted to say that so the social resilience model, which is the model that we did the train the trainer on in um, Massachusetts uh, is um, neuroscience based so that it looks at the impact of the brain and actually the whole human nervous system and what we can do, what it needs to change and what it needs to be its best self. And you know we know this because now of all the improvements in imaging, brain imaging, and not just the improvements in brain imaging, but in the ways to interpret them. We know much more now about how to interpret images that come from the brain and its functioning. And so one of the reasons Janice mentioned the various hotspots in the world that I've taken the social resilience model, one of the reasons that I've been able to do that is because 
we all have the same brain structures and processes. We all have a nervous system that's wired the same way. And so you can take a model like SRM into diverse cultures uh, without being insensitive because the the whole way we all work is the same. And this, we're gonna talk about some of those ways. And the other piece that really, you know how every now and then you see, you come to a place in the road of your own professional development. Like Bert, Yuri Bronfman Brenner was one of those moments. And when I encountered Peter Levine's work and Dan Siegel's work, people that were working in a very practical way with neuroscience, I was excited. And I just think that, being able to pay attention to how do we then, what do we do with what we learn? And a concept that I came across called appropriate technology really stood out to me. And appropriate technology, some people say it was, uh, that was developed, that idea was coined by Gandhi. I don't know if that's true or not, but the person whose definition I like is Jonathan Turner. And he says that appropriate technology is a technology that ordinary people can use that decreases their dependence on systems they have no control over. And so in my work, uh, a huge focus of my work has been with marginalized communities in one area of the world or another. And what can we do to equip people with this neuroscience information and a practical set of skills that they can use to improve the climate of health in their body, both physical and emotional health. And from my perspective, uh, it builds dignity. And so I consider this a model that promotes dignity because we have a train the trainer model where we can equip all kinds of people with it, with these skills and concepts and uh, children as well as adults can use it. And it, we all need to know about how our mind body system works and lots of people don't have the information. So there's also a sort of elitism in our healthcare system, I think, where there tends to be an attitude that we little people don't really need to know this information as long as we just do what we're told to do, follow, good care instructions and then we'll be fine. And I've had a couple of, of illustrations of that and I'll tell you a quick one, it was when I first arrived in New York City and I was asked to come to meet with a commissioner of um, an agency that had a lot of control over people who were incarcerated and when they come out. And so I was, she was asking me about SRM and I was telling her and she sort of paused for a minute and gave me this puzzled look. And she said, why do they need to know? It sounds like jargon. Why do they need to know that? And I was so taken aback by the idea, first of all, of objectifying people that I was really devoted to by calling them they in that kind of disdainful way. But it was the idea that certain levels of our professional world uh, get to know this information, but a whole range of people who really need it don't. And so it really was one of those turning points in my own way of thinking about my work and my role in the world. Uh, and how do you build dignity in ordinary people so that they have the information they need to take care of their own resilience? So I'm going to be talking with you a bit about how those systems interact with individual brain body system and the brain body system of systems. So I hope that interests you because it's really exciting. So here's a little true or false. And then I put or sort of um, look down these three questions. I have a self-care practice that supports my physical and emotional health. Just think if that's true for you, false for you, or sort of, I think mine would be sort of, sort of. Um, I know that when challenges arise, I have a support system to rely on. True, false, sort of. If I learned to, a new way to tackle challenges, I would be excited. Now, I hope nobody says false or, or sort of. I hope all of you are unabashedly excited about that idea because that's a piece of what I hope we're going to do today. And so here are the presentation goals. 
I'm going to offer this lens to you that I hope will excite you about ways to think about your own life, your organization, and the vulnerable populations that you serve. To describe the power of two of our core concepts, they're neuroscience-based concepts that both speakers, uh, both Jake and Kevin, have talked some about today. I think our uh, the three of us form a really nice web of information for you um, to describe these two concepts and how to create coherence in the design, not just of programs or practices, but in policies. So part of the ecological lens is to say that if what we're doing is working um, with just one part of a system, like let's say we're just working with kids and we don't pay attention to the families or the staff that are working with kids or the circumstances of the communities and how their attitudes are about kids or those kinds of kids, then we're missing some of the boat, I think. And our programs and practices won't be as effective because our policies won't be coherent with them. And so we want to explore how neuroscience can offer a roadmap of concepts and skills that can contribute to the health of your nervous system, as well as the nervous system of systems. So we don't very often talk about that nervous system of systems, but that's what a part of that sort of the second part of what I'm going to be talking with you about. And so here's the ecology of, of resilience. And you can see that it includes a focus on interdependent systems of influence. And it includes both individual and systems level factors, because this is a complex world we live in. And even though we have to simplify things to make sense of them and to design coherent and structured programs, we still need to know that whatever we're designing is embedded in another larger system that is also having an effect on those systems that we're trying to work in. And so an ecological orientation recognizes that there are gonna be limits to intervening in just one part of a system. Okay, so let's go back though first to our basic building block, your brain. This illustration, I'm, I've just sent a book off to an editor. I just mostly completed this book. Um, and the person who's doing my illustrations, her name is Yurina Seo. And she's just great. So now I have all these illustrations. She's the one who's been doing the illustrations for my skills cards that some of you know. Um, we just did a skills card. I was telling people before your session started that we've just finished a card uh, to use with uh, Ukrainians. It's being translated right now into both Russian and uh, Ukraine. And we have a big population of Ukrainians here in New York City, and I'm going to be doing presentations in that community so that we had this big urgency about getting the card out. And it's a piece of appropriate technology. Talk a little bit about it later. But if you look at these little facts about the brain, uh, all about growth and change, and look at that, your body makes about 2 million new red blood cells every second. So now that's a busy brain. And that's going on without any effort on your part, except to eat good food so that it can do that. That your brain physically stops growing about age 18, but it keeps changing for your lifetime. And that's because of the concept of neuroplasticity, that we know that the brain has the capacity to change itself and grow new neurons and change itself by pruning away neurons that you don't use anymore. So most of us have had that experience of practicing something and getting really good at it. Uh, Steph Curry, the basketball player, it's, my kids think it's hysterical that I'm using a, a sports person because I'm not a sports person. But I read this story about Steph Curry and you know he has that amazing basketball shot that's from behind the practically the furthest point you can stand on the court. And the story was that as a little boy, he would lie in his bed at night and take a ball, a wadded up ball of his sock and throw it up to the ceiling without ever letting it touch the ceiling. So he was developing this precision, even as a little boy, over and over hundreds of times. And, you know, in his brain, the neurons were getting bushier and bushier with their dendrites as he practiced that. 
And my guess is that if he's, you know, retired at some point and stopped doing that, that he wouldn't get so good at that shot. And most of us can think of something in our lives that we've practiced and uh, gotten good at. And then you stop and, you know, it goes away, like playing the piano or something like that, where you can do it beautifully. And then at a certain point, it usually takes quite a long time with music to prune those away. But it's all based on what you pay attention to. That's how you control the brain that you have. And so all of in SRM, all of our skills are based on attention and learning how to take control of your attention. And so this other one, I think is hysterical that your, your, uh, your brain can pot, uh, produce enough electricity to power a light bulb. So it's no accident, you know, that when people have a good idea in a cartoon, it shows up as a light bulb in the brain, <laughs> because when you have a good idea, your, your brain is busily generating all that, that electrical energy and you can, um, you can light up a, a light bulb. And then the last one is unbelievable, I think, in terms of this is inside of your head, that there are as many neurons in your brain as there are stars in the Milky Way, about 100 billion. All that is inside your head. So, and then the best news, I think, is that you have the power to change your brain. If you're a pessimist, you can change it to becoming an optimist in a relatively easy way. That, and today I'm not gonna focus on SRM skills. I'm gonna really be just focusing on a couple of concepts because they lend themselves very well to this sort of ecological orientation and they build on what both uh, Jake and Kevin have said. Okay, so here's the first ecology that we have, which is that we have a social brain and in utero, our nervous system, our brain and nervous system, it's being laid down uh, and it's being laid down as a result of many systems. And so we, and I'm gonna recommend, and it's in here someplace, if you don't know about the Dana Foundation, their whole focus is on brain-oriented research, D-A-N-A. -A. And they have a magazine that sadly just put out its last issue, but you can get it online, it's free. It's called Cerebrum, C-E-R-E-B-R-U-M. It's a part of the brain. Um, and in this particular uh, issue, it's called uh, The Brain and Poverty. And it talks about what happens to children's brain who, when they're born into poverty. So in utero, by the second trimester, a baby's hearing is 100% developed and their taste is 100% developed. And so we know then that th things that cross that placental barrier are stress chemicals in the mother, uh, the impact of, of uh, racism and marginalization. We know that in low-income families, they're much more likely to live in a, an area where there are factories that produce pollution or in New York City, the lowest income neighborhoods have highways that go right through the middle of them. Um, and so there's a higher rate of ingestion of pollutants than in other uh, neighborhoods that have more income because politicians of course don't wanna lose those voters. Food scarcity is a huge thing in utero. And so what it's telling us is that as this baby's nervous system is developing, there are things from the ecology of its life that are coming in to shape outcomes that we may never know are operating, but that are. So for example, food scarcity and so many marginalized communities uh, live in what are called food deserts where there aren't enough grocery stores that sell uh, you know, a wide range of food particular to their preferred diets and so forth. What we know about the developing brain is that when there's food scarcity, the food, the nutrition that does come through uh, the placenta into the growing baby goes first to nourish the brain. And if there's any nourishment left over, it, it nourishes the organs. And so we don't know this when a baby's born. We don't look at baby's organs and say, oh my God, his kidneys are suffering because he didn't get well nourished. But he may end up as an adult getting, um, having some kind of kidney disease or heart disease or any number of the other things, asthma, things like that. And so we 
on the subway, I mean, I see people all the time with little babies feeding them some kind of colored liquid like Kool-Aid or a flavored drink. I mean, just one of the worst things you can put into a baby's system. Unemployment, you know, the stress in a family of being unemployed and what that does, those stress chemicals cross the placental barrier. And so we aren't fresh little clean slates when we're born into the world. We already come in with either pluses and minuses, strikes against us in some cases. And it's good for us to know that. So kids' behaviors aren't only shaped by what's happened in their life since birth. They can be primed in utero. And so here's a, a little list of some of these stress, distress, and trauma outcomes, the marginalized uh, kids who grow up in marginalized communities. This is from that poverty article in uh, Cerebrum. Um, they already are showing emotional regulation issues, cognitive function issues. So this is kids who are born into poverty. And, and so ecologically, it would say that not only do we need when these kids are in our residential facilities or in giving, getting our services, we need to be paying attention to what do we need to do to improve conditions for pregnant and parenting mothers so that these kids are getting the proper kind of nourishment, as well as uh, orienting parents to the importance of uh, calmness and kindness. You know, Jake was talking about kindness, Kevin, you were too, because they have a ripple effect across generations. And again, there's research to demonstrate all of that, that this multi-generational. When I start working, I work with largely people who live in marginalized communities and especially those with a, an incarceration history. I start and I say, how many of you or anyone in your family have had heart disease? all the hands go up. And then I say, how about asthma? Many hands go up. How about stomach or GI problems? All the hands go up. I mean, these kinds of illnesses are not because people don't care about their health. It's because they're, we, they don't live in a context that supports good health. And so we just need to know that as care providers, that there are things beyond what we're doing that shape outcomes in our work. We also know that parents of special needs kids have a high rate of PTSD. I once read that uh, parents whose kids are diagnosed with juvenile diabetes, that those parents, this was a study of people who had kids that were three years old, 77% of this one study, it was not a large one, but had PTSD. And this one of a study of hundreds of parents, this was an Australian study, um, you can see the citation if you want to look it up. Hundreds of parents with children on the spectrum, 18.6% themselves met the criteria for PTSD. We need to know these things so that we can reach out to parents in the kind of way that would help them uh, feel safe with us and, and get some attention for that PTSD. And so we certainly know that fear can live in the bodies of children and adults, as well as in the bodies of communities. You know, the body is a storyteller and SRM, one of our skills is tracking. And people are taught, kids and adults are learned to taught to track the sensory level of the way their body is talking to them. What's your body telling you at the sensory level? And so you see Be Bessel van der Kolk's quote about the body being reset to interpret the world as a dangerous place. And so listening to Jake talk about all the wonderful things they do. I mean, one of my favorite Jake stories is, uh, get ready for a story about you, Jake, is he was telling uh, me about this child they had who wasn't talking. And they, I guess the staff, I may get some of these details wrong, but some of the staff were saying, you know, we just, he just won't talk. We can't, uh, we haven't had any success with him. And the gardener said, oh, he talks to me all the time. And one of the things that 
I understand that Navalis does uh, with their staff is that everybody who works there is considered part of the team and so is oriented in that Waldorf model and Rudolf Steiner's work. And the idea that a child could wander out into the garden and talk to the gardener and somehow in that context feel safe enough to speak. And also that the gardener was in on a meeting where he was told this kid wasn't speaking and could he, his opinion was even you know, listened to and heard is another piece, I think, of what makes Chine schools such an unusual kind of place, because we typically don't include custodians and uh, workers of the crossing guard and people like that in our work, even though they often have a lot of information about the children that we're working with. And so this idea of neuroplasticity I mentioned to you um, we can change, help the brain change in ways that increase the capacity to self-regulate in ourselves as well as in children. Increase pro-social behaviors. I mean, one of the reasons why I've been asked, especially in Africa, to go after these horrendous things like in Rwanda, the um, genocide, and in Kenya after post-election violence is because people's nervous systems, when they get out of kilter, there's there's a tendency for people, even good people, to do really bad things and lash out and uh, with violence. And so we know that by helping people learn how to manage their reactivity, they can wire in what we call a deeper zone of resilience, and it promotes pro-social behaviors in people who typically might not even be uh, violent. We worked with a guy in Thailand, a grandfather that now had his five-year-old because her parents were killed in the tsunami. And he came into this temple where we were working and he said, I've never hit anybody in my life, but I've started hitting my five-year-old granddaughter. And it was because his nervous system was so dysregulated that he starts, you know, you start being very reactive. And so what we're trying to do with the, the social resilience model is to create a climate of health in the body, decrease stress chemicals, which are incredibly toxic to us after 20 to 30 minutes, by give, equipping people with very practical, easily learned skills that you can do without people even know you're using them. And so then when they're practiced and a uh, woman, Liz Stanley, and was did a study of Marines in California using a very, she came through our training and Peter Levine's training. And she's incorporated a lot of different things into her model, but she did a study that showed that between seven to 16 weeks of practice wired something into the brain. And so that's not so long to spend, you know, if you spend five minutes a day using some of these, the skills that SRM uses or others that you can actually wire in much greater stability into your nervous system, whether it's a yoga practice or anything like that. It's a practice. And so there's the nervous system. And in our focus, it's only on this part, really not only, but it's, we're targeting the autonomic nervous system, which has two branches, the sympathetic, which is your activator, and the parasympathetic, which is what calms you. And you know, we're like, we are creatures of nature and nature has systems and processes uh, that, are, that require balance. So if there are too many uh, rabbits born, the coyote population increases. You know, there's no discussion about it. It just happens naturally. It's kind of a miracle really how we're set up in so many of our systems of nature and we're, beings of nature for to set up for balance. And so inside of our body, we have those systems too. And a big one is the way the nervous system functions and particularly the autonomic nervous system, because it influences every single organ in your body. So it's kind of important to learn about. Are you all hearing that voice? Interesting. I, I mean, it doesn't sound like it's coming from my computer happily. So in SRM, what we're doing is we're helping uh, to rebalance, uh, the, to reestablish the healthy balance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. And so I'm going to talk, you know, I'm focusing on 
the individual level of the nervous system, but we try to do the very same things when we look ecologically. And so, oh my gosh, Dana, let's see if you actually were able to get my animation removed. This is a rogue slide that so many people have tried to remove the animation from, including Dana, and I'm gonna see if he's the one person who was able to do it. Unfortunately, so, I, don't, I don't think so, Laurie. Uh, it just won't be, well, we just have to let it have its way, right? <laughs> right? Anyway, but be prepared. It'll be kind of here and there as it comes in. But these two red lines represent the resilient zone. And inside of that zone, you can uh, think clearly and strategically. It doesn't mean that it's la-la land in there. You can be mad or sad, but at a level that doesn't raise the stress chemicals so much that they block your capacity to think clearly. So that's important. So that's the resilient zone. And so now I'm gonna click through and then once it's done going crazy, we'll talk about it. All right, so we have it. There's the rhythm, that's the natural rhythm. Uh, the increase is the sympathetic and the decrease is the parasympathetic. And they work in this wonderful balance when we're inside that zone. And there it's gonna just click through it. Oops, so let me just go back and see if I can, you know, see it's not even gonna let me have the picture of it, but I happen to have it on a skills card right here and you can see it here, let's see. Unfortunately, Larry, Lori, because you have the blurred background on it, so oh, I'm gonna be able to it won't let me that. do it. Yes, it will if I get it close enough. Anyway, it goes up and down, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, my gosh. Um, and when it's there, like maybe that's how you are now, all of us, except for me, where now I have a little more sympathetic activation because again, this slide is like a rogue slide. Um, but we can be sad or mad in there, but not at a level uh, that uh, prevents us from thinking clearly and making good decisions. And so one of the things that we know inside your brain, all of us have two of these little smoke detectors. Uh, if you think, how many of you have a smoke detector in your house, at least one? And how many of you have ever had the situation where the smoke detector went off? If you, let's say you made a cup of tea and there was a lot of steam, or you were cooking something, a toast in the toaster and the smoke came out a little bit, <laughs> Kevin, um, most of us have had that. And it happens inside our brain too with the amygdala. So the amygdala has a negativity bias. It's in your middle brain. If you hold your hand up, this is Dan Siegel's hand brain. I just love what he does. So if you hold your hands up like this, so everybody put your hand up. I can see if you do or not. Um, if you put your hand up like this and then you put your thumb into the palm and then you take your four fingers and close them over, that's a model of your brain. So that the fingers that close over are your cortex. And then if you open it up, the middle brain is the limbic system. So that's your thumb. And at the end of your thumb is your amygdala. And you have this in each hemisphere of your brain. And then down here is your brainstem. And SRM works at the brainstem level. We work with sensation and automatic uh, processes. So examples are blinking your eyes. You know, have you tried really hard during this session to remind yourself to blink your eyes? No, it just happens automatically. And so we um, have these functions that go on in the fight, flight, and freeze response are also located in the brain stem, which is a big piece of the way we work with people who have a lot of reactivity. Because the amygdala, can it does have a, a bias for anything that's unusual, novel, in your environment, particularly anything that could pose a threat to you. And so let's see what we'd get here. Here's your resilient zone. Then a traumatic event or a traumatic trigger happens and it throws your system all out of kilter so that you either are bumped out on high with those kinds of characteristics up up at the top, or you can get bumped out on low with the kind that, and both uh, Jake and 
um, Kevin were talking about the kinds of symptoms that you're seeing in the workplace as, as well as in the kids you work with. And then lots of people bounce between the two. So sometimes they're on high and sometimes they're on low and we can often misdiagnose those people with bipolar disorder when that's not what they're having. They have, uh, they're having a, you know, the effects of traumatic experiences um, shaping their nervous system. So we don't need to medicate children. We call them ADHD, a legitimate diagnosis in kids and sometimes can be helped with medication. But if it's because of a trauma history and not because of ADHD, that child doesn't need the medication for that, just as an adult doesn't need it for bipolar disorder if the reason for the bumping up and down is due to um, trauma or distress. Okay, so now we're gonna to start to shift a little bit at the systems level. So we know that at, at least two pieces of brain food, two essentials that the nervous system must have in order to be to do its best and stay inside and deepen the resilience zone, because we don't all have the same depth. Some people have a very narrow resilience zone and it doesn't take much to bump them out. And other people have really deep ones, um, our safety and attachment. And if you think back on the earlier presentations, both Jake and Kevin were talking about the vital role of a sense of safety as well as the vital role of attachment, <clears throat> you really can't separate them. They're like interchangeable systems. If you have solid attachments, you feel safe. If you feel safe, you can build healthy relationships. So they go hand in hand. And the question we always need to be asking is, what am I doing in this moment to build a sense of safety? Or what am I doing in this program to develop positive attachments, because then the amygdala can reduce its vigilance and much different kinds of outcomes start to happen. And so safety in the body, you can see all these ways that uh, if the body is safe, all these organ systems that we have are, are affected in the autonomic nervous system. So we're, you know, it becomes a an essential component of any kind of decision-making that we're going to engage in with challenges. And attachment, um, you can see, we talked a little bit about bonding and access to resources, but also if we broaden out that systems lens, what exists in neighborhoods and community programs that help um, people feel safe? did a big study for NIE years ago, and we went into the homes of inner city parents and we were asking them about their involvement in the schools because they weren't very involved. And they said, Our, the attitude we get when we go to school is that by the teachers is I've got mine and you've got yours to get, meaning the teacher has succeeded, she's economically stable, but they weren't. And they were made to feel like outsiders and they couldn't believe that we had actually come into their homes to ask their opinions. So safety and attachment oriented services and experiences really make a gigantic difference in outcome. And how do we advocate for those beyond our unique organization? How do we advocate for things that are needed in the community because the community is acting on our clients? And so expanding to the nervous system le level, let's look at the resilient zone again, which happily is not animated. And so there's the resilient zone with challenges and supports. And what do I mean by cultural software? I mean, cultural software is, are things like the policies, the programs, and the practices that are happening within the organizational setting. And so do we have what I would call organizational plasticity, the capacity to roll with unexpected change like COVID? And so we heard Jake talk in a lot of exciting detail about how his school and community rolled with the various waves of COVID and how some of the waves, you know, required something different as they went through it and got more experienced with what staff needed and what their students needed. 
So how do we develop principled, embodied, and generative work teams? Because when we don't, this is what we get at the systems level. So these relentless demands and rapid changes, we can call those COVID, some of those, but we can also certainly here in the United States are having a massive upheaval about what we mean by democracy. So when we see those kinds of things, we can get stuck as citizens and as organizations on high with the kinds of things going down the top, a lack of tolerance, fear-driven reactivity, bullying, moral distress. We see moral distress across our healthcare care providers or being stuck on low, isolation and apathy, social fragmentation. We need to be looking not just at individuals, but at our systems. And are we in a system that's in dysregulation? And if so, how do we use the concepts of safety and relationship or attachment to, to begin to bring that system back into its resilience zone? And so here are the kinds of things you can, these are just a few little ones, pre and postnatal classes for new mothers, especially that focus on issues of spoiling young Mothers often think that when you pick up a newborn baby who's crying, that they're going to spoil it. A baby cannot be spoiled that young. They just, it's, they just can't. And long ago, a guy wrote a book, not even that long ago, um, uh, saying that, warning people about picking up babies too young. And he did a huge disservice to new parents. Kids and cops programs, homework centers and community centers. You know, workers who are sensitive to signs of distress in themselves, do you track your own level of distress? And then do you have tools? Like in SRM, we have very tangible to practical tools to use at the first sign of distress. So it doesn't get that reactivity, doesn't get wired in and spread in a kind of contagion to other levels of your system. And do you have state and city policies that support dignity, positive attachments, and safety? All good questions to ask in any system that you're in. Those are some examples of ecological approaches with kids. Do they have opportunities for empowerment? This is a program in Philadelphia where kids uh, are invited to join adults in painting murals in the, on the walls of abandoned buildings and so forth. So we're each wired for resilience, but we need the proper brain food to manifest it. And two of those pieces of brain food are safety and attachment, and they can really support uh, resilience and being able to bounce back from difficulty, but also Jake was using those uh, definitions, I think it was you, Jake, about then also being able to be productive and take some risks during times of relative stability. Risk taking during a safe time is also a sign of resilience. And that this, these kinds of concepts apply to systems of all sizes. So I encourage you to think about your own system and is, when is it in its resilient zone? What are the characteristics of your particular setting that tell you it's in its resilient zone? And what are the signs when it's starting to go out and when it's all the way out? And some systems do go into that shutdown, stuck on low. Others get very reactive and aggressive with each other. We have so much of that happening here in the United States today where there's just a lot of high reactivity on the streets with people. And so that's the end of my presentation. And we may have a few minutes for a couple of questions if anybody has any. Yes, we do have time for questions, so feel free. And it's easier for me rather than putting them in the chat for you to just uh, say them or raise your hand and um, say I have a question and then you'll appear in the talker box. Well, I hope if there are no questions that it means that you really are um, sitting in your excitement about thinking ecologically about a neuroscience approach to resilience because we very thrilled to work. Thank you.
So that's all on my end, Janice. Thanks so much, Lori. I was trying to type you a little chat message and I'll just give it to you verbally. Thank you so much. This is a fantastic presentation and it's so relevant to the work that we've been doing here in our state, trying to build in resilience with your training and so much more. And I love the concept of thinking about organizational plasticity and really trying to help hardwire in resilience in a way and, and a deliberate focus as as Jake said earlier when we've been very trauma saturated and it focuses on the negative and to do the disservice of the resilience and the positive and the strain of what I hear from you Lori and from Kevin and from Jake is that managing through the pandemic um, requires a lot of masterful skill with a concerted effort on wellness, joy, pleasure, fun, and holding the hope. And I loved uh, Jake's quote that um, it, it took a global pandemic um, for the, the world to recognize that people in caring professions do a good job. <laughs> and so to be an effective leader this day, important concept to, to be a sponge and to uh, soak up the rubbish um, and hold the hope for everybody. So this to me has been a fantastic opportunity for us to continue to hold the hope in Massachusetts. Your work is fantastic. You help us all get to a better place. So I'm gonna look, pause if there are any last thoughts and questions, this is your opportunity. And I think Dana is gonna be putting in Lori's um, presentation into the chat for people to download. And they'll, we'll also be getting the CEU information downloaded there. That's really important if you want credit <laughs> for staying and participating and, um, and helping yourself along, do make sure that you follow the link. Feedback is our friend. We need it. We thrive on it. And we want to make sure that we are shaping what we do to meet your needs. So, oh, presto changeo, just like that. Dana has put Lori's presentation in the chat as well as the Survey Monkey um, link. So, um, anybody want last question opportunity? We've got a few minutes. Uh, the presentation, it's a PDF download to Catherine Clark's question. She doesn't see it. It's scroll up before your, your question there, Catherine. Uh, Janice, can I just make a comment? Please. Um, I think um, <clears throat> I'm obviously over in the UK and I'm across the pond. And um, I had this conversation with somebody else over in America uh, at the start of the pandemic. The global pandemic hit all of us, and I think it is good. It, I find this type of event really reassuring <clears throat> to know that um, there's other people across the world doing the same type of work, because although we're all in our own bubbles trying to experience things differently, it can be a very lonely a type of work, I feel. Um, care work is very difficult. And doing this type of stuff, you have to think about yourself and think about your own self-care and that kind of stuff. And it's, um, it's really good to link in with people like yourselves over, over there in Boston and, and Laurie's work in particular, which is very much around positivity and strength-based stuff, which I think we often take for granted. There's so much stuff about how terrible the pandemic was, and it was. Lots of people died. Lots of people had lots of problems. And I'm not devaluing that. Um, but there's also a tremendous amount of creativity from people and a human resilience to really fight back and go, actually, um, you know, we can see a better future. We can make things better for ourselves. And I think that's an important message to get across. And I think Laurie's work and, and lots of tips from um, Kevin's presentation about, you know, for those people that had to work from home, you know, what you can do about your own self-care and mental health. Um, I just think it's uh, it's a kind of shared community of practice that really helps us get through it. Um, and hopefully, you know, whatever I presented today, some something will be picked up by somebody and they'll run with an idea and hopefully it will make a difference um, for their setting. And kind of that's what this is all about, really sharing the difficult work, but also sharing the creativity. Um, so I thank you for letting me be part of it. I really appreciate it. 
Much appreciated, Jake. And uh, for those that don't know, there is a bit of a time zone difference. So <laughs> Jake has had to adapt in interesting ways to be able to join us. So thank you for your flexibility, Jake. And, and again, um, thank you, Jake and Kevin and Lori for really your masterful work, your tremendous leadership and sharing your, your uh, inspiration and your brilliance you know as i said at the outset you have all been leading transformative change in your respective worlds and you were the last voices that we heard before covid settled in for a couple of years so it's really um, a gift and it really helps us hold the hope to come back <laughs> and to learn again from you so thank you all so much for this um on the horizon i hinted at this before you can look forward to uh, another statewide six core strategies training that will be coming to help us you know recalibrate refocus and re-engineer. Um, you can also look forward to uh, more teachings, more trainings. Um, hopefully, Lori will say yes to next year's work and to Janina Fisher. And in July, we will be hearing from Greg Smith from Pennsylvania, who has done extraordinary work um, in helping to really fade restraint and seclusion in that state for many, many years. So much more work ahead of us. Um, and thank you all for being here. So we've got downloadables, we've got Survey Monkey, and we've got um, kudos and thank yous to the faculty coming into the chat. So I will mute myself on that one. Thanks, everyone. Take good care. I think that's a wrap. <laughs> yeah, thanks everyone. Have a good week. Thank you guys. Be well. Take care, Take care from the UK.